Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, The Uyghurs in China, An Inconvenient Genocide with journalists Tom Jelton and Robert Siegel. Today's Zoominar is in partnership with Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative, which allows journalists to do in-depth reporting on anti-Semitism and other deeply ingrained prejudices around the world. Tom Jelton was a correspondent for MBR News for nearly four decades, reporting on national and international news from posts in Washington and around the world, including from Latin America and Central Europe. Tom also covered U.S. diplomacy and military affairs, first from the State Department and then from the Pentagon. During his years at NPR, Tom was honored with two Overseas Press Club Awards, the George Polk Award, the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, and National Headliner Award. Tom is the author of many books, including Bacardi and the Long Fight for Cuba, which is a unique history of modern Cuba told through the life and times of the Bacardi Rum family. In his final assignment with NPR, Tom was a religion and belief correspondent, reporting on the changing religious landscape in America, the formulation of personal identity, the role of religion in politics, and social and cultural conflict arising from religious differences. Tom most recently served as Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative Fellow and produced the article, An Inconvenient Genocide, Why We Don't Know More About the Uyghurs. For 30 years, Robert Siegel was the senior host of NPR's award-winning evening news magazine, All Things Considered. In 2018, he was awarded the Edward Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award in Journalism. He's been honored with three silver batons from Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University, as well as the American Bar Association's Silver Gavel Award. Currently, he hosts Navigating the New Abnormal, a series of web seminars sponsored by American Friends of Rabin Medical Center on the JBS Jewish Broadcasting Service Television Network. Robert is a special literary contributor to Moment Magazine and serves on the advisory board for Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Please welcome Tom Jelton and Robert Siegel. Suzanne, thank you very much. And uh, Tom, it's great to see you. Not great that I see you yet, but there you are. Hi. Great to see you again. Great to be again. Here. Uh, and I should say at the outset, uh, first of all, Tom and I worked together for many decades. And, and uh, uh, there are awards and there are awards. Polk Award is, a, is, 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 a, uh, is, is one of the classiest recognitions of journalism that a reporter can possibly win. And uh, Tom, Tom won one of those. I also want to just put on the table that in my capacity as a member of the advisory board uh, to the Daniel Pearl Initiative for Investigative uh, Journalism, uh, I was uh, part of a discussion of what to do uh, this year. And I suggested that um, uh, for a change, rather than have a piece that discloses or that uh, uncovers uh, uh, racism or uh, human rights abuses, uh, we should address the case of a people uh, who have been victimized, and the victimization has been pretty well documented, uh, but very little seems to happen in response to all of that documentation. It's the story of the Uyghurs. And uh, Tom immersed himself. Uh, I also suggested that uh, a, a really great reporter just retired from NPR, and uh, maybe you can get him to do this, and, and uh, Tom obliged. Uh, the result was this uh, cover story in the September-October uh, issue of, of, uh, of, of Moment, uh, and um, it says an inconvenient genocide. Uh, Tom, we have to deal with some definitions uh, in, in this yeah. interview. And the, and the first one is Uyghur. Uh, we have to, and first of all, because this is something oral, we should say you spell Uyghur, either U-Y or some people say U-I-G-H-U-R. Who are the Uyghurs? Uh, you know, Robert, I had, to, uh, I had to learn about the Uyghurs for the very first time in about 2002, 2003, something like that. I'd never heard the term before, to tell you the truth. Didn't, was completely unfamiliar with the Uyghur people. And at that time I was covering the Pentagon and um, some Uyghurs had been uh, detained uh, on accusations of being involved in a terrorist conspiracy at Guantanamo Bay, the US uh, detention center at Guantanamo uh, Na Naval Base in Cuba. And the U.S. government was faced with the uh, predicament of, of finding what to do with them. When they decided that they didn't need to be held any longer, they had to decide where they would send them. And um, the obvious choice would have been China, except that it was already clear 
that the Uyghurs were being persecuted in China. And so they couldn't send them there. So that was my introduction to the Uyghurs. I didn't know how to spell their name. I didn't even, I didn't know how to pronounce it. Um, but since then, obviously I've learned a great deal uh, about the Uyghurs. They're, they are a minority population in Northwest China. Um, about 12 million, uh, with about 12 million population, culturally and historically, uh, they are descended from the Turkic peoples who moved into that region of Asia in uh, about the sixth or seventh century. There were also there was also an indigenous uh, Indo-European population there at the time. So they're sort of the uh, uh, their ancestors are sort of a combination. They don't have basically anything to do with the ethnic Han population, which is the largest, uh, which is the the majority uh, ethnic population in, in China. They speak a completely different language. Physically, they are different. Um, they have, they are largely Muslim as a result of the uh, Arab influences in the uh, 10th or 11th century. Um, so they do not fit with what the Chinese authorities want to see, which is a culturally and politically homogenous population. Conformity and obedience are very important in the Chinese Communist project. The Uyghurs are clearly an other population and the Chinese authorities have been very uncomfortable with the existence of a other population, which explains why there has been such tension over many years uh, between the Chinese Communist Central Authorities and the Uyghur people. Again, as I say, they are basically a Central Asian population. They have much more in common with the Uzbek people uh, than they do with the Han Chinese people. In fact, I understand that the Uzbek language and the Uyghur language are mutually intelligible, mm -hmm. which gives you a, an idea of, of who they are. And they are nominal, a little bit more than nominally Muslim because they're so far removed from, the, from most of the Muslim peoples. Their adherence to Islam can be a little bit marginal, but they are uh, Islam has been very important to the Uyghur identity. So you have a Turkic uh, population that is Muslim, speaks a different language, and has a different physical appearance. They're clustered in one part of Northwest China on the Northwest border of China. And that's basically who the Uyghurs are. Uh, well, the, the second definition that I want you to give us is, is the, that of genocide. Uh, it's, a, it's a provocative word, uh, and for many people, it summons images of, of death camps or, uh, for that matter, uh, uh, Rwandans uh, rampaging with machetes and, and uh, committing mass murder. Um, who has defined genocide and what is it? <clears throat> well, genocide, uh, the definition of genocide is in the UN Genocide Convention. Uh, which was formulated and approved in the aftermath of uh, World War II. And not surprisingly, the impetus for the elaboration of a genocide definition was, of course, the Holocaust. And the man who coined the term, Raphael Lemkin, was in fact a, a Jewish lawyer in his native Poland who was very concerned with the uh, uh, practice of state-sanctioned state, uh, atrocities. And he coined this word genocide, geno meaning race and side meaning killing, basically. So the definition certainly implies a group killing or as you say, mass murder. Mm -hmm. But when he defined it in, um, in his book, he actually made it clear that it should not be uh, defined narrowly as requiring mass murder. He saw it, instead he said it was the, um, he defined the term as a genocide is a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of the essential foundations of the life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. So in his definition, it did not require mass murder. It did mean the destruction of a people in whole or in part. Uh, the... Uh... Uh, the title of your article, An Inconvenient Genocide, uh, 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 obviously requires some justification. So to describe for us uh, what sort of uh, uh, tactics have been used against, uh, against the Uyghurs by the Chinese government. Right. Um, well, first of all, uh, the uh, <clears throat> New Lines Institute uh, a year ago put out a very thorough report uh, in which 
the various components of the definition of genocide were singled out and examples given of what was happening to the Uyghur people in each case mm -hmm. in order to justify this idea that in fact, what the Uyghurs have been subject to amounts to a campaign of genocide uh, by the Chinese government. Among those, um, among those elements are, for example, the uh, forced sterilization of Uyghur women, uh, including forced abortion, the separation of Uyghur children from their parents, um, up to a million uh, Uyghurs, uh, largely from kind of the leadership class of the Uyghur population, have been imprisoned. And the children of all these imprisoned Uyghurs uh, have been sent to uh, boarding schools uh, where they are forbidden from speaking um, their own native language and they're forced to assimilate into the uh, Han culture. Uh, and so anytime this was one of the elements of the definition of genocide that's laid out in the UN Genocide Convention, the separation of children from their parents. Um, and, the, and the prevention of births is another one that is singled out in the UN Genocide Convention as being uh, tantamount, uh, as, being, as indicating uh, genocide. Now, there are some, there are some problems with this, uh, Robert. And in fact, there's been some controversy about whether it is legitimate to say what's happened against the Chinese, uh, the Uyghurs uh, is genocide. One problem is that it requires the finding of intent uh, by the government. And that is a very difficult thing to prove. Um, I think the, um, so what we, for example, the US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in a, in a very recent report uh, concluded the following, that it is gravely concerned that the Chinese government may be, may be committing genocide against the Uyghurs. So I think this is a typical formulation, just all holding back from a, you know, a, um, a declaration uh, of genocide. I think that um, if you sort of, if you don't try to think of genocide in highly legalistic or judicial terms, but rather in more descriptive terms, it is certainly possible to say that genocide is happening among the Uyghurs. And that is, in fact, the yeah. position of the U.S. government. They have not uh, taken any sort of official government action, but there have been pronouncements both under the Trump administration and under the Biden administration that genocide seems to be uh, occurring. One other, one other point, in addition to genocide, uh, 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 an accusation against the Chinese uh, with respect to the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs is that they're committing uh, crimes against humanity which is defined in a little bit more precise ways. You can, again, you can look at specific things that have happened with the Uyghurs that do coincide or do align with the definition of crimes against humanity. Yes, the, you mentioned the, uh, the report that came from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which is called To Make Us Slowly Disappear. And among, uh, in, in addition to the four sterilizations which they mention and the uh, uh, involuntary implants of, uh, of IUDs that women right. uh, say they cannot, uh, of a sort that the women cannot have removed without a physician uh, assisting them. There's, a, there's a, a paragraph that I'm just going to, to read. It's remarkable. Beginning in 2014 and relaunched in 2017, uh, the, the Chinese government instituted a program in which approximately 200,000 Communist Party members were sent to Xinjiang, to the province where the, uh, the Uyghurs live, and embedded in Uyghur households. Uh, these groups live in Uyghur homes uh, where they investigate, monitor, and report on the individuals and families uh, on a daily basis. And then all that information is then sent to a central uh, a database. Uh, what the... Uh, and what the Holocaust Memorial Museum attached a great deal of importance to was that the Chinese uh, 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 claiming to be alarmed about potential splitism that uh, the Uyghurs might want to secede from China, as you, you mentioned, the Uzbeks, as Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and uh, Kazakhstan all became independent states when the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, but but what, the, uh, what the Holocaust Memorial uh, report points out is that there seems to be no attempt to to identify any particular Uyghurs who are responsible for splittist uh, politics, the, the, the punishment and the treatment of the Uyghurs is always collective and seems to be a, a directed broadly at the population. And anytime you have collective action, uh, action against a broad civilian population, that 
very much is consistent with crimes against humanity. The idea of crimes against humanity is not that they are crimes against individual people, but that they are crimes against a, an entire civilian uh, population. Yeah. And you mentioned the, um, you know, the deployment of uh, several hundred thousand Chinese communists to um, the, Uyghur, the Xinjiang, the Uyghur region. This is just a phenomenal thing. I think that nothing that I read sort of shocked me as much as this. You actually have, uh, as you suggest, the Chinese, uh, Han Chinese moving into the Uyghur houses, in some cases, even sharing their beds mm -hmm. and you know, be really sort of stationing themselves within the Uyghur household. Um, and the idea is they got to eradicate the, the Uyghur culture, It'd stop them from speaking the Uyghur language, stop their practice of Islam, take away their cultural identity, and force them to assimilate into the Han Chinese population. All of this, uh, including uh, the population of, what do we figure, between a million and three million people who've spent time in some kind of of a prison camp or re-education camp in Xinjiang. This has come out through news reports. There's very little direct access, but enough has come out that uh, you don't have to go ferreting, uh, you know, uh, too, too deep to find it. And so the question is, and it's a question which for me is reminiscent of, of the, uh, the question we ask of the world, we would have asked of the world in the 1930s as information about what was happening to the Jews in Germany. Uh, was was filtering out, and as uh, Kristallnacht was uh, was was publicized, um, what what are the forces working against denouncing this, against doing something, against taking action? Where's the tension, and uh, how important is it to either U.S. Uh, society, U.S. business, U.S. government, uh, to not put the Uyghurs at the top of the list of our concerns or near the top of the list of our concerns with China? Well, uh, as you know, Robert, because you were in on this decision, this is why we decided collectively to title this article an inconvenient genocide, because uh, it is simply has not been convenient to the U.S. government, to uh, U.S. businesses, uh, you know, to many U.S. interests to really uh, take a strong stand uh, against what's happening with the Uyghur population. We, I talked in this article a lot about the parallels, as you suggest, between the reaction to the rise of Hitler in the 1930s and the reaction to the repression of the, of the Uyghurs. And the, the parallels uh, are really astounding. Uh, the depth of U.S. business investment uh, and ties in Hitler's Germany made it very difficult or awkward or inconvenient uh, for the uh, U.S. government to sort of take a strong stand against Hitler. Uh, you know, I quote in this article, um, a letter that the U.S. ambassador to Germany, William Dodd, wrote to President Roosevelt. Uh, and he pointed out <clears throat> in this letter, he said, at the present moment, more than 100 American corporations have subsidiaries here or cooperative understandings. I mentioned these facts because they complicate things and add to our war dangers. Now, that is very similar to the situation we have with China. In fact, U.S. business investment in China, U.S. ties with China, trade ties with China are far more extensive than what the United States had with, with Hitler's Germany. So the complication or the inconvenience is, if anything, compounded uh, in comparison to what it was with respect to Germany. Hundreds of U.S. corporations um, do business in, in, in China, and we as American consumers or global consumers, for that matter, have come to depend on products made in China. Uh, you know that um, U.S. Uh, consum consumers of, of cotton goods uh, have, by their buying decisions, uh, choices, shown that they prefer goods coming from China. They're obviously cheaper, mm -hmm. um, but to the extent that these goods contain cotton, uh, it's a very high chance that some of that cotton is produced in under conditions of forced Uyghur labor. Uh, in Xinjiang cotton fields. Uh, cotton, uh, Xinjiang accounts for a fifth of the global supply of cotton. So, uh, and then you have, um, you know, the um, supply chains of electronics manufacturers and uh, solar panels. I mean, the list goes on and on. The extent of manufacturing ties in China that we have right now 
is such that any real concerted crackdown, for example, on forced labor, uh, would, would really call into question um, many supply chain, chains and make it very difficult. So there's the inconvenience from a business point of view. I think just as important is that the United States has many different agenda uh, items with respect to China. If you mm -hmm. just take one that's very important to progressives, for example, climate change, the United States cannot work on global efforts to combat climate change without the cooperation of China. Um, and so you have to make a decision. Uh, are you going to prioritize cooperation with China to address climate change? Or are you going to prioritize com confronting China over human rights issues? Those are some of the reasons why it is so inconvenient to address the genocide occurring in Xinjiang province against the Uyghurs. What, what, by the way, it, it, well, is there any indication that uh, uh, drawing attention uh, to evidence of what's happening to the Uyghurs has any impact on the Chinese government? Is there, is there any sense that there's a, a shame factor or a, a, a some, uh, some convincing of the Chinese to, to ease up because of, because of protests from overseas? Unfortunately, it seems to be exactly the opposite, mm -hmm. uh, actually, that uh, um, I don't want to characterize the Chinese people or Chinese cultural culture in any way, but there's this very strong strain of nationalism, certainly among the Chinese communist uh, authorities, mm -hmm. that takes any kind of criticism of their policies uh, personally, it takes great offense at it, and actually uh, reacts uh, in such a way as to, in some ways, complicate things further. I mean, the, some of the few U.S. companies that have, have attempted, for example, to um, address issues of forced labor in their own supply chains have essentially been blacklisted in China. Um, the punitive actions on the part of the Chinese government against any, uh, any interest, any organization, any corporation or government, for that matter, um, have in many ways been out of proportion to the actions that were that were taken. So it's been very frustrating, I think, and we've seen this not just with the actions of the US government, but with a number of European governments. There are, you know, the European Union tried to send a parliamentary delegation to China to investigate what was going on with the Uyghurs. And the Chinese government not only uh, not only refused them entry, but you know, sort of put, put sanctions against the Europeans themselves as a punishment for even dared, dared, having dared to raise the issue. And this, this comes at a, at a moment when, uh, uh, you know, the, the economic, the great game of the 21st century uh, is to uh, uh, crack the Chinese market. Uh, and, uh, uh, and one would hope to contain China as well from seizing Taiwan or uh, expanding its, its, uh, its, its claim to, to uh, over international waters. So there, there are many, many issues on the agenda. Exactly. And uh, the Uyghurs appear to get, uh, to get lost right. at the bottom. Yeah. Um, you told me that in addition to the, the examples that you got into the art, which is it's a terrific article in, in a moment and a very extensive one, but there, there still were some limits on what you could, what you could include. And, and one thing that uh, you told me hit the cutting room floor is when you think about it, 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 it becomes obvious, but it's um, it, it's an odd sector of American life to have a stake in in having steady relations with the Chinese, and it's our universities. Yeah, right. Um, there were um, not very long ago um, between three and four hundred thousand Chinese students enrolled in U.S. Uh, universities, almost all of them paying full tuition, and in the aftermath of the financial collapse of two thousand eight. Uh, when many universities saw their tuition revenue drying up uh, and also legislative appropriations, you know, in the case of public universities uh, being severely limited, uh, there was increasing dependence on these Chinese students and a kind of a concerted effort to, I wouldn't say recruit Chinese students, but certainly to welcome, welcome them. Uh, and while I did not find any evidence that the Chinese government was was deliberately sort of um, sending particular students to America. Um, it, was, it was very clear 
that the university's dependence on these Chinese students was making them somewhat reluctant to really tackle uh, human rights uh, issues head on. And there was a very well-organized Chinese Students Association active on many US campuses that uh, sort of was monitoring what was happening in the university setting when issues of Chinese human rights were raised. And in case after case, some real confrontations took place between Chinese students and sort of human rights advocates and a kind of a, um, a concerning uh, reluctance on the part of the university authorities to really endorse that kind of human rights activism uh, on, their own, on their own campuses. Uh, it, I found that both the, um, the uh, democratic, uh, what was it called, the De democratic students group on US campuses and the Republican student groups on US campuses put out a joint letter mm -hmm. in which they expressed concern that their own administrations uh, we're not acting forcefully enough in, in order to, uh, to sort of raise the issue of human rights uh, 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 on their own campuses. And, and when the, 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 the uh, situation of the Uyghurs is raised with Chinese officials, uh, what, what do they say? How, how do they respond to uh, documentation of sterilization or education, re-education camps, uh, uh, 200,000 people being sent to live squat in people's homes. Uh, how do they justify it? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the documentation and evidence uh, is somewhat anecdotal in basis because uh, the Chinese authorities have not allowed human rights investigators into Xinjiang province at all. The UN Human Rights Commission has been trying for years to get in there. They've been denied access. Most of what we know about what has taken place with the Uyghurs has come out as a result of the testimony of Uyghur exiles who have managed to escape, or you know they have their own sort of channels of information, communication uh, within Xinjiang. And, and so while the evidence is overwhelming, it is not documented uh, in such a way that the Chinese government um, is forced to deal with, uh, you know, proven facts, as it were. Uh, and the position of the Chinese government has consistently been that there is a danger of, I think, as you mentioned it at the beginning, of splitism. Splitism. Uh, they call it splitism. Uh, the, the prospect of uh, the Uyghur people trying to split off from China and that this would sort of damage the territorial integrity and the cultural integrity of China. Uh, and they also have repeatedly raised the um, prospect of terrorism, claiming that the, uh, you know, the Uyghurs, they are a Muslim people and they have, you know, the Chinese authorities have put forward various uh, you know, claims that uh, that there is a terrorist threat in the in the um, in the region, and that the actions that they have been taking are meant to sort of combat the terrorism. So they come up with they come up with their own arguments. They basically just uh, refuse to deal with the accusations in any sort of serious way. Yeah, and and they uh, the the Uyghurs, as as you pointed out in the story of the Uyghurs who'd been rounded up and sent to Guantanamo, whom I believe I interviewed by phone when they were in some island way station on their way to, uh, I forget where they were ultimately given, whether it was Palau or someplace where they were ultimately. I think some ended up in Bermuda, which in Bermuda. You know. <laughs> I think they were in Bermuda when I when I when I had a phone conversation with them, but they were they were caught up in the unfortunate fact that uh, 9/11 was. Uh, open season on uh, on Muslim nationalists, wherever they might be, even if they were uh, far from terrorists. Uh, and a lot of countries jumped on board and accused some minority in their country as being just as bad as Al-Qaeda and, and, right. uh, and, and, and the Taliban. Um, I think we both had the same reaction, Tom, when the disappearance uh, from public life of the Chinese uh, tennis player, uh, Peng Shuai, uh, claimed on social media that she had been a victim of sexual assault by a, by a former senior uh, politician in China. Uh, the Women's Tennis Association suspended tournaments in China, uh, right. which is an, it's, it's exceptional behavior. Uh, we're, we're heading into the Winter Olympics, uh, and uh, there's a very much more uh, uh, nuanced uh, protest uh, attached to that. 
But um, it was a reminder that the cause of the Uyghurs, unlike, say, um, uh, the, uh, of the Tibetans, uh, who, who had, uh, first of all, were personified by a worldwide spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, and then celebrities like Richard Gere became uh, their advocates. Um, uh, unlike people who had some high profile, the Uyghurs don't seem to be uh, connected to any similar uh, uh, iconic figure uh, who, who can uh, uh, speak on their behalf. Yeah, I mean, with the, in the case of uh, Feng Shui, um, you know, she was a Chinese face of women's tennis. Uh, and women's tennis, of course, is a very big sport in the West, and therefore her fate was directly connected to something that is very popular and uh, important uh, in the West. The Uyghurs, by contrast, are kind of exotic. Um, as I said, I mean, I, I was uh, considered myself a sort of well-educated and informed reporter, and I was very uh, unfamiliar with, with their existence and their people. Uh, and I think that that's uh, still the case. I mean, the, the people that, uh, in order to sort of get concerned about the Uyghurs, you have to have a kind of a, a curiosity about the diversity of world populations. I mean, there's no direct sort of connection to the American people in the way that um, there was with, uh, with Feng Shui. So it certainly is an obstacle. And um, this is relative, has happened relatively quickly. I mean, it's only really been since 2014 that the repression of the Uyghurs has been so pronounced. So we're still seeing that. Um, and um, I think the one encouraging, as it were, development is that this is one, the situation with the Uyghurs is one of the few situations that seems to unite Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have seen both in the House and the Senate overwhelmingly lopsided votes uh, on legislation to sort of, um, to in some ways, punish U.S. companies that do that benefit from forced labor um, or to impose sanctions against Chinese authorities. We still haven't been able to get a single bill um, reconciled through both the House and the Senate. The House and the Senate have, have their own versions of legislation which have yet to be reconciled. But if you look at the arguments, um, there is very strong bipartisan, almost unanimous support for doing something in support of the Uyghur of the Uyghur cause, so I do think that we are beginning to see sort of greater recognition of the suffering of the Uyghurs. But 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 from the way you've you've described it, it it sounds as though uh, the it, 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 the United States or Europe, for that matter, uh, might pass legislation that would. Uh, effectively clean their hands or their company's hands of dealings with uh, 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 with a part of the country at least that's that's uh, uh, where people are performing forced labor and they're they're having their identity stolen from them. But it, it, it it's not clear that the that these steps would actually change Chinese behavior. Um, certainly, we're all aware of Hong Kong, and uh, I, I wonder how effective. Uh, declarations or sanctions uh, from Europe or the United States can be when it comes to this problem? Well, uh, it's not just the problem with the Uyghurs. I mean, um, they've never, with the possible exception of South Africa, uh, what, what evidence is there that sanctions have really changed the government's behavior? It's pretty yeah. scant. I mean, uh, as you know, I'm very familiar with, um, with the Cuba uh, issue. Yes. And we've had more than 50 years of very stringent sanctions against Cuba that um, have not done anything to change the Cuban government's uh, actions. So I think there is, um, unfortunately, there's good reason to be very skeptical uh, of this. Uh, I think that the, you know, um, naming and shaming uh, is a, a practice that probably has more potential for changing behavior than targeting sanctions. I mean, it's extremely difficult to come up with a set of sanctions that would actually be effective enough to present enough leverage to chain the government without, um, without sort of setting in motion a greater disruption of world trade and so forth that, uh, 
it seems that nobody wants. So I know that from talking to, to um, people who are active in this area, that the greatest hope does lie in some sort of name and shame um, policy. And I mean, if you look at the most recent example, Peng Shuai, um, she disappeared from public view. There was a great deal of concern um, about her safety, her status, and the Chinese government in the end was forced to sort of present a video in which she said that she was okay. And you know, there are a lot of concerns about whether that's legitimate. It doesn't satisfy the concerns that people have had, but it was a case where pressure on Chinese forced them to do something. And I think it was an awkward moment for them. Uh, I mean, it's embarrassing to, to China to lose um, uh, tennis competition, women's tennis competition in China. Uh, so, you know, you can find specific uh, incidents, specific examples where a naming and shaming policy does apparently embarrass a government. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in the South African instance that you mentioned, it turned out in the end that sports uh, seemed to have as much leverage as anything on on, yeah. on South Africans who took their sports very seriously, and uh, and being isolated from the world and in athletics uh, was uh, was was a very serious sanction. Um, uh, there used to be, I think, in the 1920s and 30s, there was a movement of a pan a pan Turanian. Uh, movement, Turanian being an adjective for Turkic. Uh, and uh, uh, there was some uh, agitation among the various Turkic peoples who in those days lived everywhere from Xinjiang uh, all the way west to Turkey. Uh, and um, Turkey was at the center of that. And Turkey being a revolutionary society in the mm -hmm. 20s and 30s, uh, you know, at least some people there toyed with this idea of being the leader of all the Turkic peoples. Uh, uh, which used to be a big deal in Turkey. Where are the Turks in all this? Well, that's a really interesting story. Um, and it has to do with the incredible power of China within the world. Um, Turkey uh, in the last few years has undergone some real economic problems. And uh, China actually came to the rescue of, of Turkey and with multi-billion dollar loans. And I certainly don't know whether there was any kind of condition uh, on that assistance, but we did see that once China began aiding Turkey economically, it really backed off its support uh, for the Uyghur people. Up until that time, uh, Turkey was the one place that had been welcoming uh, Uyghur, Uyghur exiles and refugees mm -hmm. and providing them some protection. But we've seen in the last few years, sadly, we've actually seen the the Turkish government extraditing some Uyghurs uh, back to China. So it's an example of China being able to use its global influence and wealth uh, against governments that might be tempted uh, to challenge it. I mean, uh, if you look uh, throughout the one of the one of the things that I found in writing this um, this article was how few Muslim majority countries, not just Turkey, but many other cases as well have been willing to support the Uyghurs and stand up against China because of their own close ties and dependence on Chinese aid, cooperation with China. I think that um, Bosnia, uh, which has a, doesn't have a majority Muslim population, but has a plurality of, of Muslims, uh, is one of the few um, Muslim countries to actually uh, support the Uyghurs and stand up uh, against China. Um, most recently, Robert, and this goes back to concerns that Trump Chinese raised um, back in the beginning of the war on terror. They thought that uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan were going to be supporting the Uyghurs. And there were some accusations, some allegations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of close ties between Uyghur terrorists, Uyghur extremists, and the Taliban. Well, in August, the Taliban returned to power uh, in Afghanistan, and they basically have turned their back on the Uyghurs because they value instead close relations with China. Uh, and I think we have to credit our former NPR colleague, Emily Fung, for doing some very important reporting in this regard, showing that the, that the Uyghurs were hopeful that maybe the Taliban would be friendly to them. And in fact, it's been, it's been just the opposite. So uh, Chinese influence in the world uh, among um, you know, developing countries or whatever you want to call them, uh, or Muslim majority countries is such 
that uh, that it's been very very hard to get any kind of international cooperation in this effort. Well, Tom, it's it's uh, you wrote a terrific article, and hearing you talk about it has been uh, has been great, and uh, uh, you make me almost miss work right now, uh, <laughs> uh, getting to to talk with you this uh, this long. We never got to do fifty minutes, though. You, I know this is this would have been a very long conversation for all things considered, uh, but I want to uh, have uh, turned to Suzanne Borden. Uh, who has been fielding questions from from people who've been listening and uh, have heard them put them uh, to you, yes. Suzanne? Yes, thank you both. Uh, there's lots and lots of questions to get to. Um, the first is, what is the relationship, if any, between the treatment of the Uyghurs and the occupation of Tibet, and are there other oppressed minorities in China? Uh, the I think that what the treatment of the Uyghurs and the treatment of Tibet have in common is this very oft-stated concern about separatism. I think that, uh, you know, the Chinese authorities are really insistent that the Chinese state, that China as a country, retain its, its current borders and its current identity. And Tibet, you know, the accusations that have been, the Tibetan Buddhists have never been uh, charged with or alleged to be terrorists. It's always about separatism. And that is the, the one thing that they have in common with the Uyghurs. So you do see um, a similarity there. And in terms of the way the Chinese government has reacted, in both cases, you see a real um, isolation, imprisonment, persecution of the leadership uh, of these minority populations. I mean, obviously, the Dalai Lama is uh, uh, not welcome to circulate in China or in Tibet. Uh, he's been in exile, you know, virtually um, throughout um, his period of leadership. And we see with respect to the, to the Uyghurs, a real effort to isolate the cultural, not just the political leaders of the Uyghur people, but the cultural, the artists, the intellectuals, the academics, the writers. These are the people that have been really singled out for persecution because they are the ones that advance the idea of Uyghur identity and Uyghur culture. And in that regard, a lot of similarities with the actions taken against Tibetan Buddhists. And, and you know, uh, Susan, Suzanne, may I add to that? Absolutely. I was struck in reading the uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum's report uh, that there is a, a, a senior party official uh, who is, has been in charge of, uh, of, of uh, Xinjiang. He may still be, but he came from being in charge of Tibet. That is uh, uh, the same, uh, the the same uh, uh, senior Chinese official, and the stories from Tibet some years ago did involve the settling of lots of Han Chinese uh, to try to alter the population balance and in, uh, in Tibet, and an anti-religious uh, sentiment generally that guided Chinese policy. But it is, I, I, I was struck by the uh, fact that the same uh, uh, same official has been uh, the uh, the boss in both Tibet and in uh, in the Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the U.S. diplomatic boycott of the Olympics does anything? And do you think that the U.S. should just completely boycott the Olympics? Well, Robert, I don't know if you have an opinion on that. We, we've been trained as journalists to sort of uh, hesitate to <laughs> put out like strong policy prescriptions. Uh, I would just point out that the prospect of a diplomatic boycott. I mean, I don't think people watch the Olympics in order to sort of like spot the uh, delegation. <laughs> I, I kind of doubt that that will be very noticeable. I mean, the, you don't think that the gold medal for memos for, 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 for uh, political reporting and memos uh, attracts much attention. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there were, there have been um, precedents in 1980, uh, you know, we boycotted the Moscow Olympics, and that was a, a very big deal. We've stopped well short of that in this case. I think, you know, when you asked the question about should, should people, should the U.S. not take part at all, um, I, I actually was part of the crew from All Things Considered that went to China in, uh, in uh, uh, 2008 uh, when everybody could get a visa because the Chinese were hosting the Olympics and it was a rarity for a, a non-democratic society to be host of the Olympic Games. And so the Chinese said, well, we'll make ourselves very open to, uh, to, uh, to media, to international media. Um, I, I, I think that the Olympic movement ought to find it somewhere in its, uh, 
soul, since it claims to be something more than just a, a, a commercial operation, uh, to include a, a democracy as being one of the one of the values that it that uh, should be present in countries that host that host the Olympics. And I think this is problematic. It was problematic in 1980 because the Soviets had just invaded Afghanistan. Uh, but it's always going to be uh, uh, problematic when you celebrate uh, uh, brotherhood and uh, uh, the you know the unity of all mankind, uh, and uh, and do so in a country that is uh, sending people away to re-education camps in large numbers. And I think uh, the Olympic movement, as it calls itself, would do well to to embrace democracy as a requirement. So. You know, one other point, <laughs> the commercialization of the Olympics has made it much more complicated. I mean, because it's not just a question of, you know, what the U.S. government does, a diplomatic boycott. I mean, you've got all these corporate sponsors yep. uh, who have invested very heavily in support of the Olympics. And that, that has made it a much more complicated um, challenge. Thank you. Uh, Tom, you mentioned um, that uh, goods from China, uh, specifically cotton, it's a probably a good chance that it was um, picked by Uyghur slave labor. Uh, someone would want to know, is there a way to identify the supply chain so people can avoid buying some of those products? That is a really good question, Suzanne, and it's, a, and it's one of the reasons why we haven't sort of seen a sort of more effective uh, a campaign because what happens is that the cotton fibers, the cotton from Xinjiang are often uh, uh, combined with uh, cotton fibers from other places. Uh, and it becomes very difficult to sort of separate out what percentage of a cotton product is, uh, is, is, is sort of the result of forced labor uh, in, the, in the Uyghur um, in the cotton fields in Xinjiang. The other, the other problem is that um, supply chains by their very nature are very opaque. Uh, and it's not as though these governments, I, I should say these, these Nike or whoever else, it's not as though they are going to Xinjiang and buying Xinjiang cotton. I mean, they are getting their cotton, you know, through wholesale channels and they don't, they claim that they don't know where the cotton is, is coming from. Uh, and one of the, they have actually, um, been very concerned about um, about U.S. Uh, congressional action to impose uh, penalties on U.S. companies that are found to or suspected of dealing. Actually, one of the one of the one of the uh, points of some of these legislation is that companies have to prove that their uh, cotton products do not include uh, cotton from Xinjiang, and it's almost impossible to prove yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so that is. Uh, it's a really difficult situation. Robert, you were going to say something. No, no, no. I, I was just, I was just uh, uh, interested in what you were saying. <laughs> um, as a major Silk Road city, has Kashgar been affected by the Uyghur issue, specifically the tourist trade? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not familiar. Uh, tell me more about that city. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm familiar with the Rumki, uh, but that. Um, uh, I'm not, I believe I'm not the so city's sure. in the region, is in the region yeah, where the Uyghurs the are. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Chinese government has what they call a Belt and Road Initiative uh, that is really aiming to sort of link Beijing uh, with um, suppliers from countries to the West. And it sort of is a 21st century of the old Silk Road. Uh, and that road and this... Um, Belt and Road Initiative, the Silk Road and the Belt and Road Initiative come right through uh, Xinjiang. And so um, that is one of the reasons I think that the Chinese government is so determined to maintain control uh, in Xinjiang because it is economically very important to them. Uh, as far as tourism is concerned, um, it has in recent years become very, very difficult for foreigners uh, to get into Xinjiang. It used to be uh, much easier, but you know, I'm assuming that uh, because of concerns about human rights investigators sneaking into Xinjiang to sort of see what's going on there, it has become very difficult for, for outsiders, for foreigners to get into that province. Thank you. Um, uh, is anyone forecasting the actual extermination of the Uyghurs by the Chinese government or is no increase in the level of oppression expected? 
uh, I think that the um, extermination is kind of a loaded word, and this is something that I think it's important to emphasize. We don't see mass killings uh, in Xinjiang. That has not been the issue. And so if you, if you talk about sort of what you might consider cultural genocide or cultural extermination, I think that is a very real concern, and I don't think it has diminished uh, in any way. Um, you know, one of the um, really startling data points uh, from Xinjiang has been the, the, the uh, birth rate um, among Uyghur women has been uh, dramatically reduced just in the last four years. The UN only started collecting fertility data about 70 years ago, and the drop in the birth rate in Xinjiang among Uyghur women uh, is greater than anything that they have seen in 70 years. So what we do see is that um, Uyghur women are having fewer and fewer children uh, as a result, presumably, of, of you know, what's going on with the separation of children from their parents and forced sterilization, the IUD implantation and abortion. So if for no, no other reason that the birth rate is going down, I do think you have to be concerned about kind of the gradual disappearance of the... Yeah. Just to, uh, and to put that in some context, the, the Chinese regime uh, has, has intervened very much in, in, the, in, in the private lives of, of people in terms of, of, of reproduction. There's the one child policy was the law mm -hmm. in China for, uh, for decades and Chinese minorities were given a pass. They were allowed to have two kids. Uh, so uh, until relatively recently, uh, members of min ethnic minorities in China, you, you would hear this from Han Chinese on the one, one reporting assignment I got uh, there, that um, what are the minorities complaining about? They're allowed to have, you know, uh, two children, whereas the majority Han people are only allowed to have one child. That's not, not the case anymore, but um, uh, the dramatic difference in the birth rates among the Uyghurs and and the, uh, the Han Chinese in Xinjiang uh, suggests the real result of government policy. Yep. Suzanne, you... I, 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 I did it, I was muted. Um, so <laughs> at, at this point, what can governments, Western governments actually do about this situation? Well, as I, I, I think that, um, you know, as Robert and I pointed out, I mean, I think if you take the reaction to the uh, disappearance of Peng Shui, uh, Peng Shui, you see, uh, you know, that actions, um, whether by governments or non-government organizations or businesses, uh, can have an effect. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that I think that the most promising uh, approach has probably been something along the lines of, of naming and shaming. Um, and whether that is a, a policy or a practice that governments uh, can follow or, or whether it's something that needs to be spearheaded by non-government organizations, I think is, a, is an important question. Mm -hmm. You know, Tom, I, there's, there's one other point I wanted you to, uh, to bring out, which is you, you talk with Uyghur, uh, well, are they exiles here? Are they yeah. refugees? I mean, and um, do they, uh, are, are they harassed by the Chinese government? Are, are they able to, uh, do they feel confident that they can speak with you, give interviews, um, uh, talk about the situation back home, or are they concerned for their families, uh, uh, say? No, that is absolutely uh, not the case. I mean, I talked to three uh, Uyghur women, uh, each of whom uh, has very courageously continued to speak out about what's happening with their people. And in each case, family members have suffered uh, as a consequence. Uh, when Uyghur women, um, I actually begin the article with um, uh, a story about uh, her meeting, her, 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 her brother was uh, chosen as a distinguished visitor to the United States by the US State Department. Um, she became outspoken and she has not heard from her brother was arrested uh, shortly after returning from the United States uh, to uh, Xinjiang and she has not heard from him since. She is convinced mm -hmm that his imprisonment is a direct result of her speaking out. Um, there was, uh, uh, there was a, a young woman, um, uh, Juhair Islam, whose father was a very distinguished uh, uh, Uyghur academic uh, in actually based in Beijing. He wasn't even living in Xinjiang. Um, he's been imprisoned and she has felt really constrained uh, about speaking out 
out of concern for his safety. So, and there was a, a, a woman, uh, Rushan Abbas, whose uh, sister has been imprisoned um, in the aftermath of Rushan speaking out. So there have been many cases. And I spoke to somebody else who actually didn't want me to interview him. I, I, I spoke to him off the record. He, he, he wouldn't even be quoted you know, um, without his name. He was so concerned that somehow uh, the Chinese authorities would find out that he was cooperating with me. And so he, um, he refused to be, to be interviewed. So I think there are very serious concerns about that. And uh, Suzanne, if you don't uh, have any more uh, questions, there's one other point I wanted to, uh, I, to raise. I, I just wanted to uh, say one more thing. Um, some mm -hmm. people have asked, have Jewish organizations been involved? And I put an article that was just out today, um, how 200 Jewish organizations sent a letter to President Biden asking him to take more action. Um, and so you can read that article, not, not from us. And that's in the chat. Um, and then, yeah, Robert, you, you ask your question and then I've got one um, to end the program today. Uh, well, I just was just took note when you mentioned the State Department, Tom, uh, uh, did declare uh, the, the treatment of, of, the, uh, of the Uyghurs, uh, either, was it, I think, genocide. Yeah. It, it, it was on Mike Pompeo's last day, I think, in office. And it, it reminded me, of, I remember learning from a judge who was a friend of my family's in New York. He was very proud to have been a midnight judge uh, whom a, a mayor had put on the bench uh, shortly before leaving office. He owed nobody anything. Uh, he, uh, uh, he could just do what he thought was right. And, uh, uh, and it seemed to me that sort of a thing, that uh, Pompeo didn't, didn't take the step when he would have had to stick around, <laughs> stick yeah. around to cope with the and, inconvenience of the policy. To tell you the truth, Robert, I'm not even, I'm not even um, convinced that this was a decision collectively by the Trump administration. President mm -hmm. Trump himself had nothing to say uh, about this. Uh, and when the Uyghur, uh, Uyghur human rights law was passed, he eventually signed it after waiting several days, but signed it without any comment. So uh, I would not be surprised if this was an action by Mike Secretary uh, Mike Pompeo himself. I know that he was getting a lot of advice from his own human rights people in the State Department yeah. to, to do something and say something. It may have been just an independent action on his own because yeah. it didn't carry you know, that sort of official imprimatur of the, right. of the U.S. government. Right. Suzanne, I, I, I yield to you. Great. Thank you. Um, so to end the program, um, a lot of people have asked, uh, you've spoken about what governments can do. We mentioned that Jewish organizations are taking up the cause, but what can individuals do? Is there anything we as citizens can do besides spreading awareness? Well, spreading awareness is hugely important uh, because as we've said, this is not... Um, <clears throat> this is not a condition that is very widely understood. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's the, um, whether it's the Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum report or my article or an article that came out last uh, year by the New Lines Institute, I I'd like to see people promoting these um, reports and articles on their social media feed, really, you know, talking about them. Um, I think, I think that's, that's hugely important. And then the other thing is, I think that we as consumers need to be, pay a lot more attention to where the products that we buy come from and to sort of, there, you know, there have been consumer boycotts. Um, and, you know, this might be an occasion where consumers should take seriously the origins of, of some of their products. As I said before, we you know, we seem to prefer products made in China because they are uh, inexpensive, but they, you know, they do that there is a cost associated uh, with them as well. Great. Well, thank you both, Tom and Robert. We really appreciate today's discussion you, and for really opening up everybody's eyes to this issue. I wanted to let everybody know that I put a link into the chat. Uh, so please read Tom's article, An Inconvenient Genocide, if you've not already. I will be sending an email out later this week that will include a link both to this recording for those who want to share it, as well as a link to the article um, so you can have access to that as well. Uh, please remember to sign up for next week's program on healthcare in Mali. And again, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Tom. And we'll uh, see everybody next time. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Bye-bye. Thank you, Suzanne. Great bye -bye. to see you, Robert.